Hi, I'm Tom DeRosa from Creation Studies Institute. We are so happy you're with us today. Uh, we're going to be dealing with a kind of a controversial topic. It's called the chimp man myth. And with me is Tom Raboli, uh, old friend. We've been a friend for many years since the inception of the ministry. We welcome Tom. Welcome you, Tom. Hey, thanks, Tom, for having me on with you. It's, uh, it's a joy to be back working with you again. Yeah, we did many programs on the Genesis Connection together, and so I asked him to come because we're recording this program, and I thought it'd be good to interact once more again with you, and I thought this would be a great opportunity for us. Love it. Okay, so we're going to begin right now. I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to begin with the program now dealing with the webinar title, The, the Myth of the Myth, uh, the Ape Man Myth. So here we go. Okay, um, as I move here to get started, we will we will start our program. Uh, just so you know, the, um, the the program itself, the idea of the, the the chip man myth came because I, I was reading some books, Tom. And um, oh, by the way, do you see those people? They're waving yes. to us. <laughs> Well, anyway, uh, I, I started the chip man myth because I felt that um, the idea of the chip man myth came to me because I was reading books on the idea of the ape man controversy. And I was right. reading people like Ian Tussell, the, the pocketbook encyclopedia of human evolution. And so I, I, I just reading it through it and I realized that there is so many things there that are wrong. So I wanted to, I wrote about it in the letter to Chip Man Myth, which appeared about two months ago, and we decided to make a webinar. And so we're going to begin. We have basically four topics we're going to discuss. We're going to discuss the first topic is the introduction to what is being taught in our schools. Two, we're going to discuss the challenges of walking on two legs. Imagine the challenges of walking on two legs, going from a chimpanzee to a human being walking on two legs. And three, the uniqueness of the human brain. Let me tell you something, the human brain is very unique. And lastly, the, the distinctiveness of being human. I believe those, those four topics are essential to understanding this, this chit man myth, the idea of human evolution. So let's begin. So the first thing, Tom, is that I thought we start talking about the public school, like what is being taught in our schools today? So guess what? Everybody knows, I don't have to tell you, uh, this is not new. Yep, there we go. <laughs> we have a chimpanzee and we have a man, and we're supposed to evolve from that primate. You're, you're, you're familiar with the story, right, Tom? Yes, we see this all the time being presented as, as fact, and it is not. It is far from fact. Now, I'm going to show a traditional picture here because we know that evolution has taught us a fact. They teach man has evolved from primates as a scientific fact, but this picture here kind of dictates of what's going on here. And it's it's the, the tree of life, the picture that I know when I went through college, I saw a lot of this uh, in my learning. Now today they have fancy bars and, and branches and, you know, they have no trees, they're just branches and connections. Um, but Darwin, as we're going to look at it, Darwin had a tree. And so I'm reflecting to the tree and we're going to be talking about all, all the way up here, right here. You see it? Man and ape. The last branch. The last branch, right. So we go all the way up there, and we're going to talk about that. And we're going to move a little closer, and we're going to see that, oh, look, we are, you see the branch of evolution. You see the human, the chimpanzee, the gorilla. Those are called great apes. The orangutan is part of that. And so one of the things, is they don't have any tails. <laughs> so we want to keep that in mind. And we got to throw another one in there. It's called the bonobo. The bonobo is a dwarf chimp. And supposedly it evolved, uh, I believe, one to 1.5 billion years ago. Uh, yeah, I believe. So they say. That's what they said. Yeah. So when we look at this tree, I want everybody to be aware of is that uh, there's nothing in between here. OK, so whenever you see these trees written in textbooks like they have in, you know, your kid's textbook or taught in public school or in colleges, you have these lines and these lines are just, yeah, they're just, um made up <laughs> they're they're kind of guesses 
uh, of how things happen because we don't have the connections and that's a big thing. Actually, this is verified in the statement. Uh, I, I read this in the uh, uh, Pocket History of Human Evolution. And I, I just love this, Tom, because they admit, some, they admit this. And I see this all the time when I read the literature. The variation branches of hominids diverge millions of years apart, but we don't know exactly when because we lack revealing fossils and genetic data is not precise enough. The last common ancestor between Pan and Homo, for instance, lived between seven and 5.5 million years ago. They put a lot of weight into this fossil record, bearing out what they claim that they're seeing here, but it's just not the fact. The fossil record doesn't give us that kind of information. No, and they admit it because we lack revealing fossils and genetic data is not precise enough. So ladies and gentlemen, I come and I, I just want you to be aware of what's going on when we talk about this idea of the chip man myth, human evolution. So as we go into this little history and why it's being so propagated in our public schools or in school rooms uh, galore is because Darwin promoted this idea. This is his, his little drawing of a tree in 1837. Do you know when this was done? Um, do you have any idea, Tom, when this, this little drawing was done? I, I, would, I would say that it was probably before 19, I'm sorry, 1837, because yeah, he was well, we, mulling this stuff around yeah, for a little yeah, while. Yeah, it was about 18, it was around that time. He came back from the, the Galapagos Islands. He went around uh, on the Beagle for five years. When he came back, he started to put his ideas together. And so let, let, he... Let me ask a question here, Tom. When we did these studies before, I understand that he was influenced by his grandfather and, and others. So uh, that's why I'm saying maybe this was, he was thinking about these things before he actually wow. went on the Beagle. Yeah, I, 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 I'm writing about what uh, Charles Lyle and others did. They brought back, the reason why this tree came to be is because of the long periods of time. And the, if he, if he didn't have long periods of time, the tree would not exist. He had to imagine this happening. And this is the big thing, it had to happen over long periods of time. And so geologists were looking at this and looking at the fossil record. Charles Lyle had a great influence on Charles Darwin. Charles Lyle read, wrote the principles of geology and he's the one who forced it this idea of long periods of time of slow, gradual change. And that's why Darwin could incorporate this in his idea of the tree of life and evolution. Now, what we see is this is about age 28 when he came up with the idea. So I want people to be aware that he was quite young, even though his book was published in 1859, we see the origin of species in 1837, he came up with the idea of evolution. And I found it interesting that during this time when he was coming up with these ideas, uh, he was ex going to the London Zoo, uh, Darn spent many hours and he looked at Jenny. There's a picture of Jenny right there. Tom you can see it. And, and he was just looking at her and he, they dressed her in clothes and all this stuff. And he was fascinated by this. It seemed a display of emotions the same manner as a human child, he said. He felt that he got kind of caught up and said, you know, maybe this monkey could be connected to us. And he started to write about it. And volumes materials about this idea of monkey and man coming together. So Darwin's in the thoughts. He, he published this in 1871. The descent of man. So this is where Darwin tackles the idea that man evolved from primates. My descent of man was published in February 1871. This is Darwin speaking. As soon as I had become in the year 1837 or 1838 convinced that species were mutable productions. What does that mean? It means that they can change because we believe, uh, we still believe today that God created after their kind. So then they believed after their kind, but we have a little more abbreviated idea of kind. Uh, we see variations like dog kinds and so on. Um, but he's saying that now he believes that kinds can evolve into kinds. That's what mutable production be. I could not avoid to believe that man must come under the same law. So if evolution takes place in the animal world, why can't it take place in the human world? I have to understand that. That's how we approach that. It's a big yeah. leap. It's a big leap, yes. On the origin of species in 1859, he wrote the preservation of the favored races of the struggle of life. Every, every textbook, public textbook, 
Uh, I've seen it all over. Darwin is celebrated as their hero, and the origin of species is guaranteed is guaranteed to be named also probably with the scent of man. Uh, no other book except the Bible has influenced the world since then. And today you might look at a lot of chaos, a lot of people believing and throwing things around with their ideologies, and there's a lot of chaos today. But I must tell you that if you throw God away, just like Darwin was doing, we're going to have chaos. And so we're seeing evidence of what Darwin has already portrayed as his theory of evolution, because you know, we know you, that we came from God. Tom, you mentioned about the influence of this book as compared to the Bible, and I would like to extend that a little further that you know the bible has the holy spirit that um, bears witness with us and it moves the information in the bible along because we relate to it in this book there is also a spiritual um problem with this book and hence the reason why it was so uh, adapted and so uh, accepted i should say uh, you know, the, the devil really needed this to move his ideas along. Well, I think the average man had a hard time with this, but the intellectuals of society picked it up, and that's why it became the bestseller. Before you know it, it started to reach our grounds during the Civil War. Uh, many people, uh, there are many uh, intellectuals, mm -hmm. uh, writers, poets, and so on, honored Darwin's writings. And uh, we see this in the naturalistic and romantic movement in America's literature. So, what happened with the human evolution? Well, in 1971, Darwin followed up. He finally, 1859 and 1871, some gap, but he had so much material in 1859, he couldn't fit it in. So he, he researched a little more and put this all together in 1871 and said, the scent of man, Darwin stated, and this is where it gets tricky because remember the tree of life, Tom, remember that tree? Okay. Yes. Darwin stated that the Negro and gorilla were at the same evolutionary level between man and the baboon. Wow. So that's, he was that's already, big, Tom. <laughs> if, no, when you think the tree, you got to think who has the highest branch, who has the lowest branch. The highest branch was the Homo sapien, the human. In Darwin's terms, it was the Englishman. And the Australian Aborigine was the one behind. It was lower than that. So we already saw a classification occurring. And you know what? The Confederates used this in their language. You'd be surprised how this drifted over uh, into the Civil War and so on. So I want this, this, lang this, this language in this tree that you're demonstrating right now was the basis of racism at this time. This is where it kind of came from. Ernest Heckel did a beautiful, he, he created pictures of this. We, I did a, another article uh, on, on this. And Ernest Heckel, disciple of Darwin, just, and he put the African. Uh, Negro right in the middle of it. And so, you know, this didn't help our nation when God said we're created all equal. God basically said that we came from the same dust. <laughs> um, we have all one blood. Uh, we're all creating God's image, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's where equality comes from. But now what are kids being taught about human beings if you'd want to talk about in a, in a material evolutionary sense. So this is what they're taught. There's four qualities. You need a brain size. You need a uh, good brain. You, have, you should have the ability to use tools. You, you, know, you, by, you should be standing up on your two legs you know, to be able to use them. So you need to be walking upright. And you have a, supposedly a mouth dentination that you know, symbolizes um, you know, what humans have today. Uh, anyway, what we have found is this, and we, we look at the we look at the record. We we see uh, what is taught is most of our schools and neatly illustrated in the textbooks. So the skull size increases, so does intelligence, and this is so far from the truth, Tom. It is. It, so so what they do is look at the. See, I'm going to point to it now. You see the skull the skull of a uh, this is a chimpanzee, okay? Skull of a man, okay? So when you look at this skull structure, you see that there's a lower forehead, it's more slanted, while a human, uh, a human is more straight, you see. And so they grafted a whole tree of skulls. Now, many of these are not complete, okay? The homo side on this side is, I believe, human, even though they said this is a homo habilis, this is a homo erectus, I believe this is all the same human. So what they're finding might be pieces of human and so on. Um, now, what's interesting when we talk about brain size is we found a the littlest human ever possible. It's uh, it was a, a, a Homo florensis, 
And Homo floresis had a brain size of 380 centimeters cubic, which means that he was really low, lower than the chimpanzees, the orangutans, and the gorillas. Okay, so here we are with Homo, with, uh, Homo florensis, who has a brain size the size of a grapefruit. And what they found with Homo, uh, Homo florensis is that they had tools, he had, was doing everything like human. He had formed tools and so on. Well, so they you they, use the word human here. Let me just say, wow, that's really the differential between a chimpanzee and human. What about the pygmy? Okay, that's right. very small, but look what they do. They right. they're artists, they're musicians, they're just gotta be careful they're human. Brain size. We gotta be careful of brain size because that could that, that can do is a brain size. Okay. <clears throat> brain size has never been linked to intelligence. Variation with a thousand cc's had never proved increased or decreased intelligence, period. We have about a thousand variants plus, you know, with between um you know, in our with humans, so we know how how intelligence is linked to brain is still a great scientific mi mi uh, mystery. Conclusion: The evolution of man has never been verified with brain size, and yet they're teaching our kids this fact. It's bad science, Tom. Unfact. This this lie. Yes, um, it should never be taught as a fact. So here we are with brain size. I took this out of uh, a publication. And it talks about the years of, uh, this is something that's dated, but it just basically shows you brain size and how more human we become. That's totally false. The ability to use tools is another question. So the ability to use tools, to me, is truly human. There's no question. They, they haven't defined a homo habilis tool and so on. You know, what, what is a tool? I mean, they kind of try to date tools. They try to date the arrowheads. They try to date, the, but the important thing is that we know that intelligence is important to make a tool. It needed some forethought, right, Tom? It was a very, I mean, to me, that to me is human, period. These, these tools demonstrate a projection, looking forward, forward thinking, which you don't find in a chimpanzee. They, for, they were forward thinking because by making these tools, they took time, it took skill, but there was a a reason, a focus of where we're going with this. This is not demonstrated in chimpanzees and the chimps. The, you know, it's just not there. Then we look at the uh, the view from the National Academy of Sciences, second edition, 1999. I went ahead and did this because I went back a little bit because I wanted people to understand that National Academy of Sciences is a prestigious organization, one of the most prestigious in the United States. And they're made of scientists who uh, have been well you know, well distinguished over their careers over time. Now, basically what they said is this, studies in evolutionary biology, this is their quote, have led to the conclusion that human beings arose from ancestral primates. It still, this still exists today, okay? So we know that curriculum is endowed in this, whether it be from K to, to college, this is what kids are being taught, students are being taught. The association was highly debated among scientists in Darwin's day, but today, there is no significant scientific doubt about the close evolutionary relationships among all primates, including humans. No question. Wow. So, and this is being promoted today in our schools. Now, uh, I believe that when we look at the general public is really informed. This is by, uh, we did a series of programs with Jonathan Wells and the Icons of Evolution, Tom, right. many years ago. And his quote was, was really perfectly said. The general public is really informed of deep-seated uncertainty about human origins that is reflected in these statements by scientific experts. Instead, we're simply fed the uh, latest version of somebody's theory without being told that paleontologists themselves cannot agree over it. They're having arguments back and forth. This should be here. This should be there. I see and this, this when I go and back to literature. And this is the part that's that, that, that's not being broadcast from this hilltop. They, they really the, the, the wheels came off their cart. There is a lot of confusion amongst them, and right. there's no connection either. They're all on different pages here. It's bad science. And typically, the theory is illustrated with fanciful drawings of cavemen and of human actors wearing heavy makeup. My wife and I went to the <laughs> Museum of Natural History in New York. And we, we walked by and they had the human evolution. And I knew that those creatures were made just like this guy was. They took some human and they, they 
they made models of these humans and put them out naked right up, out there in the Human Evolutionary Hall at American Museum of Natural History. Oh, and, they didn't have to put naked. I know some people that look like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, we know about it. And so, uh, again, using Jonathan Wells, I, I like to just, there is no birth certificate for a fossil buried. So every fossil that's buried doesn't have a date on it. This is just, we have to kind of figure it out. It's kind of interpretation. There can be, there cannot be connection made from ancestry because of intervals of time. Each fossil found is isolated point that is floats around in an overwhelming sea of gaps. And lastly, the conventional line of descent and ancestry is completely a human invention created after the fact. Well said. So we have to keep that in mind. And that's how I'm going to end this section. Now, the next section I want to get into is the challenges of walking on two legs with two hands. So let's take a look at this. We see, yes, for a chimp, this is a quote from my letter, yes, from a chimp to be bipedal, walking on two legs like a human, every bone of its body would have to change to walk upright. Now, that's a quote. I got this out of the, uh, I, I described this out of the, the pocket history of human evolution. <laughs> so I want to let everybody know that this is, this is a statement. They, there must be significant changes in order to form a new complete branch of species identified as Homo sapiens for evolution to work. The larger conclusion, humans are the most unique creatures that live on Earth. Unique. Period. End of conversation. So as we look at this, we see clearly <clears throat> that there is a difference in skeletal features versus a chimpanzee and a man. So we see, we can see it right now. We can see that the chimpanzee is walking on its knuckles. Hello. Uh, it's got these very big um, arms. Um, you can see the big ulnar radius. They, these are over here. Um, I mean, the radius, you can see the big radius over here. You can see these the arm bones here. You can see the humerus. So the, the shorter part of the, the, our arms are equal, you see? Our arms are equal while, the, look at this bottom part. This is what they're arms, longer. They're much, much longer, yes. And <clears throat> take a look at the fingers, they're curved and they're down. You could see them much longer. Uh, same thing with the leg ratio. Our legs are much bigger in the back and small in the front. And also very important I, that there's a, what they call a carriage angle. A human has a straight line coming down, but a chimpanzee when it walks has an angle. And that angle differentiates itself, differentiates, differentiates itself from the humans because humans have a zero angle. The carriage angle here is maybe, I don't know with exact degree, it's about 10 degrees, five degrees, somewhere around there. And that carriage angle actually makes the animal walk like that on fours. They're designed to do what they do. Right, and it's, that's important to understand. So I, I thought we might enjoy this. <clears throat> a human and you know, chimpanzees can run, but they run on their fours. We stand up right. We that's how we run. We have a narrow pelvis, uh, and we're going to go through some more skeletal features. Now the hand is unbelievable. We have 27 bones, okay? One quarter of all the bones of the human body, 35 muscles to operate those bones. The human hand has strength and flexibility, has numerous tendons, complex nerve networks that support superior qualities in the human hand. So surpassing any other creature on earth wow use wow. your hands you can see what it means take a look at the opposing thumb you see that uh, how what creature can do that the another uh, another unique attribute is found in the human hand with an opposing thumb longer than any primates we look down we see these hands have the capacity not only to grasp but manipulate objects that many different shapes but do so with high efficiency that can work delicately on fine Fine, fine tasks. So, going to ask you a question, Tom. Why don't you take a look at this picture here? Can a primate thread a needle? <laughs> uh, Can a chimpanzee no. thread a needle? There's <laughs> I, a needle. I, I would like to. I would like to see them try. Yeah, there's a thread. Okay, try it. Try to. Of course, that's magnified, but try to get that. See that big hand? Let's take a look at his hands again. See those hands? There they go. <laughs> try to put a needle in those hands. You'll see it. <laughs> that'll be very difficult. For me. And, and as we look at this comparison, you can see that as we were talking about with the legs, look at the breast, breast bones, you know, our rib bones over here compared to the monkey, the uh, chimpanzee's monkey. Uh, a larger chest. Right. 
You can see the torso, he's got more of a straight spine than we do. We'll have, we have pictures of that to show you. The leg bones, again, the carriage angle, the, the bow, the legs are bowed, they're there for a reason. Our legs are slender, straight. Also our toes, uh, their toes kind of spread apart. Our toes, our, our toes on our feet line up with the other digits. Uh, it's very important when you walk to have those digits lined up. Anybody has a sore toe, big toe, they know what I'm talking about. It's hard to walk when you have a big toe like that. The pelvis is different. Uh, our, our pelvis are wider versus the chimpanzee. We'll get into more details because I'm more, take a look at this. This is the pelvis as we talked about earlier. Remember I told you how narrow it was, see how narrow it compared to humans? As, here's chimps as long pelvic, see? It's a long pelvic, as a long pelvic. Bla the blades flare out, small gluteus and flat ilium. So you can, and then here up here, you see short pelvis, not long pelvis, okay? Uh, blades angled out, large gluteus, bowl-shaped ilium. It's bowl-shaped compared to flat-shaped. Big differences. Well, yes. little ones. So when I saw that every bone had to be changed, I said, this is, man, I mean, how could this happen? Shame on them for even thinking that this evolved. And then how about this? When you have the spinal cord, the spinal cord connects to the head through the forum magnum. Now, the, here's a question. Forming magnum. So, where does it connect on an ape? An ape it connects in the back. You see, uh, and in a human in the center. They threw this species Australopithecus in there, and this is not a very well formed skull, by the way. They just threw it in there. They said, well, maybe the skull. Even then, it's way back. It's back like a chimp. It's a chimp's. It, it didn't walk straight. Australopithecus. Well, it, not it didn't. It didn't walk upright. Because in order to walk upright, the skull has to be balanced on top. That's and right. that is clearly shown here in the Fortum Magnum with a human. They're ba it's balanced on top. Right. Uh, these other ones were forward looking like a, like a dog. And there's more, to, there's more to balance because their inner ear helps us out and so on. But that's another story. I want, I want to look at the human spine too. Human spine is a lot different than a chimpanzee's. We have curves, a lot of curves. We have S's. And you can see them magnified here. And you can see right in your tailbone, the coccyx back here, the, the sacrum right back here, and, be, and it goes right up. And you can see how our, our, it's like almost a double S. And so we're made to stand straight. As we look at the other set of bones, we can see simple curved spine, curved uh, fingers. This is the chimpanzee, long arms, short legs, knuckle walking. While we have an S curved spine, straight fingers, short arms, long legs and bipedal gait, very important for humans to walk straight. The, sp okay. the spine is designed with that dynamic curve. Without it, we would not be walking upright. We have to have that dynamic S curve in there that you're showing. Now, the next part of we're gonna talk about is the uniqueness of the human brain. Evolution's biggest problem. I, when it comes to brain, we far exceed the chimpanzee. I mean, we far exceed anything on this, on this earth. So we're going to talk about this. Okay, so take, let's take a look at the skull that houses the brain. You see the chimpanzee again, the idea of the sloping skull, narrow forehead. There it is, sloping forehead, very small, narrow forehead, long, long nose. We have a long forehead, flat, come down here, flat face. This is the gorilla. Again, like chimpanzee, look at a high ridge around the neck, around the eye, eye socket. Brow ridge. Yeah, there it is, the eye ridge right there. Okay, brow ridge, there you go. So you can see it very big. Uh, we don't have those. And they used to say there were some, uh, some of the creatures that they have dug up before. And I don't remember the names exactly, but I know the Eskimos, and because the variation of kind with humans is that they have a higher area in here, a little bit skull. skull Tom, up. if I may, we did, a, we did several programs on that subject. Right. And it was because of <clears throat> what we were told by another doctor was because of a, a dysfunction, lack of sunlight caused uh, rickets, a very like a gelatin of mixed gelatin out of our bones. And because of us chewing, the muscles pulled down and that brow ridge kind of came out. It wasn't in the babies did not have that. Only the adults had it. So it was formed because of a muscular tension in the skull. Right. Yeah. And uh, I remember the doctor who, you know, so Kuzo's name. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, that's going Remember. back a little ways, Tom. Yeah. So there's a small cranium, a protruding brow, flat nose, large jaw, large teeth. Okay, that's the that's the chimpanzee. We large cranium, 
we have big brain. We have a large cranium, flat forehead. Okay, protruding nose. Um, our nose protrudes. That's all. Small jaw and small teeth. So this is great comparison. This is the letter, so people can see it. And uh, you know, it's a great letter. If you don't, I think, hopefully you've got it in the mail. If not, you can request it from the office. We'll send you a copy. Now, although the elephant has bigger brain than humans, when it compares compare, comes to intelligence, is discovering and creating technology, solving problems, and using language, humans far exceed the elephants. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, size doesn't mean anything. Remember that? We, we talked about that earlier. I also want to show you the bottom, or the, the they call it the inferior view of the chimpanzee and the human. I had to turn the uh, chimpanzee upside down. It was a drawing uh, of the inside, and they're more distinct towards this side here, this right side right in here. This is little. This is um, this is not. It's a drawing too, but it has a lot more clarity. But there's one thing I will tell you that we have more convolutions than the than the chimpanzee. Convolutions are the little wrinkles we have in our skull. The folds in the in the brain. Yeah. Oh, the folds. We have a lot more folds. So I want you to be aware of that. And so that's something we were, and our, our and I'll get through some of the, the our brain is, uh, is very specific. We have, we have areas in our brain that do various things, including language and so on. So uh, brain, the most complicated system found is in man, a three pound brain, which as far as we know is the most complex orderly arrangement of matter in the universe. Who said this? Isaac Asimov, the atheist. So we know our brains very complex. He said it well, the most complex system, uh, the complex and orderly arrangement of matter in the universe. And so here, what, when the brain uh, compared to body size, one of the most obvious distinctions is the human brain in our, is a relatively large, wrinkly cerebral cortex. So we're going to do a little experiment, okay? I'm going to give you a tablecloth, 20 is by this, 20. Is this Ready? a test? Is this, is this a test? A test? <laughs> I want you to take that tablecloth, and I want you to, this is what it says here, take the terrible cloth, and I want you to squeeze it, uh, fold it, compress it, just the size of a grapefruit, okay? <clears throat> now, you got the idea that that's kind of how our brain is. Take 20, and just keep, keep you know, don't fold it. You're not allowed to fold it. Just kind of crumple it up. Keep crumpling it up. You won't be able to get it that small. But you. We to have a lot of surface area in our brain. Is what he's where, where you're going exactly. with this, and it's compressed in such a way that it it adds to the uh, the size of our brain if you spread it out like this, yeah. twenty by twenty feet. That's right. This would increase <laughs> wow. the surface area exponentially in the cortex or outer brain of the brain. About one third is visible while the other two thirds found underneath the hills and the valleys, the folds of the cerebral cortex. We have a very large cerebral cortex with lots of folds that need to be nourished by blood. And so we look at the brain, we see a marvel, as, as Isaac Asimov said, the marvel of the universe. Now, a highly packed with neurons, nerve cells, small spaces that make up very dense heavy, and heavy. So it's highly packed with cells, lots of cells. Uh, it's estimated that 100 million billion neurons that make up the human brain are much denser than any other animal on earth. The brain is so dense. We have brains we work with in lab. And when they, not human brains, but I work with um, chimpanzee, not chip brains, but I work with, um, um, with pigs' brains and we did a few other animals. When you take them in your hands, um, they're very dense. They're, you could feel they're, they're, there's a lot of cell material. Humans have that by far. We rank high when it comes to that. So when we look at that, we see that the neurons are shaped in a very special way. They're, they're very little known about the dendrites. The dendrites are right in here. They kind of float around. You see that over here, Tom? See how they move out? Yeah. They move out in a, in a matrix, a neural matrix, and they look to connect, okay? That's that they connect with other cells. A nerve cell may have lifespan of a hundred years. So we, our nerve cells uh, have a hundred year lifespan and they don't, re, they don't replace themselves, okay? There's no mitosis on a nerve cell. What you have is what you have, period. And they say we lose several thousand. Uh, you know, 
per day or whatever it is per you know we lose they're lost and the older you get <laughs> you wonder that's, well, it. Well, that's, that's all you got <laughs> you got a hundred billion so don't worry you got plenty of cells but you'll see what we're not really talking about cells we're talking about connections each neuron is connected uh is in is contact with ten thousand other neurons for a total of a hundred a thousand trillion connections quadrillion connections so you have you have one connecting to 10,000, and before you know it, you now you can multiply it, and you have these unbelievable pathways. I mean, this is like, uh, you know, it, it's it's magnificent to see it go. The the dendrites with the the axons, they move the signal out to the end. The dendrites they reach out, and they connect with other cells by electrical. It's electrical impulse, but it's done by chemistry. And so by the salts, mixture of the salts and so on, they open it and, and they produce a low voltage. So that's why they have, you can do a, um, a brain scan because you can measure there's electrical impulses of the brain, which is very interesting. If we were to straighten out all these neurological connections in one single line, they would stretch a hundred thousand miles. Wow. We are complicated. Wow, yeah. We're, now, how about the human brain's energy consumption? Very important. If you have all those cells, they need energy. You have to be, it's heavy. Remember, our brain is very dense. The human brain requires an abnormal amount of energy compared to any other animal because um, the nerve cells need oxygen to survive. Very important. It is well known that the human brain consumes 20% of its body budget of energy, even though it makes only 12% of its body weight. <laughs> three pound brain you know so you, you think about it uh it's now, amazing how much energy the brain really does need when you oh, have a low blood sugar it become you become very confused and disorientated and you, you have to get you have to get some you know food in there some substance in order for your brain to work right let me tell you some uh anybody have a head bleed uh, injury to the head you bleed tremendously i mean the the the, the the broad blood, 20% of your blood supply is in your brain. The human uh, cerebral cortex compared to chimpanzee's brain by weight to humans, the chimp would have to increase four times to reach the average human brain size as far as the, the cerebral cortex. This is the cerebral cortex right in here. So Four times. Four times. So it's convoluted. It has these ups and downs, valleys, and so on that represent a large gap between uh, to get over time in which the fossil record falls short. You're in transition uh, despite the internet, uh, internal disagreements as to where the place the skulls amongst the paleontologists. How do you place the skulls when you don't even, you know, when you look yeah. in terms of the, th this is what makes us, when you make us human, it's, it's, it's a lot more than this, but we need brains and we need uh, that kind of, uh, this kind of beautiful, connection with all the connections this brain is very important to for a human to function when one observes the human brain's frontal lobe it stands out as being the largest compared to any other animal front frontal lobes are essential because they are involved in motor function problem solving memory impulse mood and aggression very yeah. very important a frontal that's lobe what makes you fun. that's what makes you who you are is that frontal lobe that's right also used for identity and personality you don't want to mess with that frontal lobe because you can mess yourself up pretty bad. The ratio of the frontal frontal cortex compared to the entire cerebral cortex is very small in rodents, rats, and mice. When we go into the next to bats and cats and dogs, it's only 3.5 to 7% respectively. The ratio in apes, 70%, while in humans, we are ranked away, way ahead at 29%. So our frontal lobes are huge compared to a chimpanzee, almost twice the size, okay? So this part of the brain provides tremendous amount of space for information storage. That's why we can solve problems and so on. We have an unbelievable ability with this brain of ours. Uh, and a human frontal lobe is missing. What, what are the effects? Well, the person would not be able to plan or execute complex multiple step actions and incapable of inhabiting inappropriate propotent behaviors. Plus, the person would no longer be able to verbally express him, him or herself with language and would have to sp have specific memory processing deficits. However, I suspect the word comprehension should be mostly intact. Understanding word meanings relies more on posterior brain regions. There's a lot that goes into the frontal lobe. Very complex here. 
I want to point out, and we, you know, it's not a course on the brain, but I just wanted to point out that there are two sections that I think we have that are very unique to other section. I mean, very unique to when we compare it to other animals and so on. You know, God is a common designer. It's not common, common descent, uh, like they teach in the public school. Evolution. Evolution, common descent. We basically have a common designer. But when we look at the brain, although animals, you know, chimpanzee might resemble this to some effect, there's areas that they don't have. For instance, the Broca area. This area is where sound, speech pronunciation, articulation takes place. Uh, I have here the Broca here, your, uh, your verbal association, anticipation. You have to make sounds. So you, you try to get words, you try to think of the words, and then you produce them. And the, the Wernicke section is where we process. We actually process whether it's written, written or spoken. We process language. Very important. So these are very specialized sections in our brain. The last part has to do with our human distinctiveness. And I, I'm excited about this because this makes us different. And I can't help it, but when I think, Tom, you have a baby there? Uh, I, I not here. Maybe, uh, maybe it's you. Ah, uh, it's coming out of my computer. Yeah, yeah, that's you. I, I love babies. I do. But right then and there, you can see distinctiveness. I mean, even even the way they 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 were trying to verbalize. I mean, seriously, it's unbelievable. God in all creation gave man a special place by uniquely creating him in His image, and became Christ's fulfillment of the gospel. So we thank God that we are here and that he saved us. I mean, basically, he created us his image. We fell into sin. He came back and saved us. And I, I, I look at now I can see I can because I know him. I, I, he's given me a brain to be able to see him, be able to experience him on this earth. Uh, our spirit connects with him. Our mind, soul, our brain, you know, uh, is able to try to, you know, be mindful of him, be mind, be taking everything in and being able to give him the glory. So it's an amazing, amazing thing. Well, that is the reason why we are human. That's right. Because we have a consciousness of him. And consciousness. I'm glad you brought that up. Man is different from every his entire creature, crowned with him, him, uh, with him with glory and honor. God made us this way, period. And consciousness is the next part, has to do with self-awareness. You see. Part of our function, and I'm not just saying brain, I'm also going to say spirit, it all kind of comes together, but the idea of self-awareness, no animal is self-aware. Scientists define consciousness as being aware of one's body and their environment, okay, uh, in a complete recognition of yourself as, as in your own existence. And so we know that we exist because we exist, okay. <laughs> what is self-awareness? Well, it's, you need to be aware that you are thinking and realize your own thoughts. Think about that. <laughs> you realize that you can think and you can think your thoughts. I mean, that to me. Uh, yeah, that requires to kind of, un, you know, unbaggage that and kind of open it up to what, what does it mean and how much uh, does it describe who we are and how we are so much different than all the other creatures on planet earth we know what we're doing and where we're going and uh we can be led that's right by his unction his spirit to go places right. that's what makes us who we are human so it's obvious by doing this that you have gone into much higher level of awareness when we are able to think of ourselves so <clears throat> Being distinctly human is being and being self-aware is part of God's creation. And so they they want to name me what comes to names, don't they? You know, what? And we know that can monkeys name themselves? Do I have a name? I don't think monkeys can name themselves. They might be able to recognize themselves by certain traits and attributes. But as far as recognizing themselves, that's a big question. Humans have a right to name. We know that because the Bible has given us. Evolutionists have attempted to explain the phenomenon of self-awareness by describing it. its origins when hominids begin to work together. 
but they failed miserably produce the, uh, the objective data needed to uh, advance this hypothesis. Problem is, is that when we talk about hominids getting together or people getting together, um, how, how do you measure that? How do you measure self-awareness in that kind of phenomenon? You can't, and that's the problem. So yeah, so this guy says, evolution fails to describe how man's self-awareness originated. It didn't come from me. That's what he says. <laughs> I want to be clear about that. We're creating God's image. We know this. The first woman of mankind would be called Eve by Adam, Genesis 3.20. The name means mother of life. Eve would be the mother of the human race. So we're given the gift of naming. We know that God gave us the gift to name all the animals. God had created mankind to have dominion over the works of his hands. Psalm 8.6 has given man a special ability with intellectual awareness to become good stewards of his creation. Man is gifted man with, with capacity to take ownership over the creation that come from uh, that uh, over the creatures that roam the earth. This includes the honor of giving names to the animals. Very important. Why did God create, uh, why did God let man name animals? He was going to have dominion over the earth and therefore he can name the animals. Can you get a pet? You name a pet, right? You have children, you name your children. That's a gift from God. That's part of being self-aware. Okay, we can't name other people's pets <laughs> because mm -hmm. they have dominion over it. We can't name other people's children. Well, sometimes we do have uh, names for other people's yeah, pets. We, we, we keep them to ourselves. Yeah, we do it. <laughs> another, another interesting thing is language. So language is complex. All contemporary modern human beings use very complex language. This is from Lucelli Loro Covelli Seforsa, professor of genetics of Stanford University. There are no primitive languages. The 5,000 or more spoken today are equally flexible and expressive, and their grammar and syntax are sometimes richer and more precise than that of more widespread languages like English or Spanish, which have undergone some uh, simplification over the centuries. So here's the key. All language is complex. Again, where does it come from? Special centers in our brain. Very important. We're corrected. We're created with these centers, the Wernicke area, where we process uh, uh, understanding language, uh, being able written or spoken, and then we're able to art articulate it through our speech and be able to think about the sounds and be able to produce them. It's a complex thing. And Very we know the works. When we study children, that by age 18 months, they know 20 words, okay? And about a quarter of them are intelligible. But by age two, there are 300 words. Two thirds are intelligible. Age three, we have a thousand words. This is an exponential curve, Tom. When, when kids are small, they are developing a vocabulary exponentially. Here's another one. Age five and six, Let's 3, make a point of 4,000. <laughs> If we continued learning at that exponential rate between two and three years old, if we could hang on to that, <laughs> we would have our PhD by the time we were 12. Right. Unfortunately, unfortunately, <laughs> um, our, our brains are not able to work that. This is, this is scientific mystery. We don't understand why language, uh, again, is complex. It's a complex phenomenon. But why kids are able to exponentially grow like this? A year, an average adult has about 10,000 words in, in they have in their vocabulary, and they recognize between 30 to 40,000 words. That gives you an idea that we're not anywhere near where we should be. That's why we need to go to school and get educated. <laughs> so now getting back, process. getting back to another concept, and I, I love this concept, man is creative because he reflects God. We're a reflection of God. So part of the wonder of man, I love this book, we're going to get wrote it, and it's a beautiful book, it illustrates the fact that we are creating God's image. Because we're creating God's image, we can be creative. So we can sing, we can write poems or write books, write po we can do lots of things in our writing, we can, we can draw pictures, we can be artists, we can make things like architects make things, and we can make cars. This is unique because we have creative abilities and we have the intelligence, God's given us intelligence 
so we could use our brains and then we can be creative. So what does creative mean? Well, creativity, uh, by the way, there's a Mona Lisa, that's the most expensive painting around. Uh, I think it cost $800 million. So wow. that, 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 that's one of the most expensive, yeah, most known, most, uh, most wrote about <laughs> the Mona Lisa, Leonardo da Vinci. Humor, humans can only change. Uh, they, humans can't create. We're, you know, we're not God. We don't create from nothing, uh, but we can form and we can change things. Humans can use words, colors, sounds, symbols, tools, forming in them into new expressions. The human face expresses within itself a uniqueness that can be identified from millions of other human beings just with our face. Okay, our face is powerful because we can be creative with our expressions. We also have moral consciousness. This is what makes us distinctive. Uh, we have distinctiveness. We have intelligence, self-awareness. We have the idea of, being, of using language and being creative. We have moral conscious. We're, we're aware of what we do wrong, you see. Uh, ability to decide right from wrong is truly human. The depth of human moral consciousness tempera is demonstrated in the legal systems developed. The idea that justice for all, integrity, truthfulness, and honor are words that describe this phenomena. There's no way you could, if you say, look at your law libraries, that's telling you that you're human. Yeah. Who has a law library? Tell me what, what animal has this. By the way, Francis Collins came to Jesus, even though he didn't come to uh, doesn't believe like we believe, but he came to Jesus with this idea of moral consciousness. He knew that moral consciousness is a phenomenon you can't explain. And it, all these things you can't explain. Language you can't explain. You can't explain, I mean, the meaning of language, the words and what, how we use them, the creativity, all these things are gifts that make us unique. They did, they did not evolve. No. They were there. They were there. Here, how, the emotional depth is another. This last one, the emotional depth. These special mm -hmm. changes are used to magnify the emotional depth, expressing one's human experience. This is the only, this is the only, I mean, when you look at a face, uh, this makes us so unique. I mean, take a look at all these faces here. I mean, they're expressing different things. So they emote, our face emotes, expresses our emotions. And so we can see that we have lots and lots of emotions. Uh, when somebody gets arrested, you know what happens, right? <laughs> they don't take a picture of your belly button or your feet, <laughs> your face. And now they have facial recognition, so you got to be careful. They can recognize your face. We know that the ability to internalize the whole emotion of well-being, brain studies indicate that it's a deep part of our brain. We also know that the human face can emote a quarter of a million facial expressions controlled by only 28 paper thin muscles around our face, facial muscles. Unbelievable. Yeah, there are some scientists that have developed skill uh, that they can read faces. If you're having a conversation, they can tell if it's truthful, if it's uh, a lie, uh, you know, if you're trying to hide something, they can read that by those facial expressions right. that you just demonstrated. That's right. But face is everything. Face tells us who we are. It gives us part of our personality. So we have the idea of emotion, deep emotion. And so we look at this chimp. This chimp is not smiling. He's showing his teeth because he is angry. <laughs> I'm just reading that wrong. Angry. Animals have limited number of emotions such as rage, excitement, fear, and contentment, while humans have so many more. Get a pet and you'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> you'll see that that's what they can do. You, very complex. Humans are complex creatures with everything, with the brains, with the fact of their intelligence, the gifts that God has given us. A review. First is we have intelligence, we have self-awareness. Second, we have a gift of language. Third, we have a gift of creativity. Fourth, we have a gift of moral consciousness. And fifth, we have emotional depth, and we express that with whatever we have. So, Tom, I think at this point, I want to give a conclusion and just some ideas of what we went over right now, okay? So I just wanna take a second. Number one, the first part, there are many problems with human evolution, but the most important one is that for it to be there, should be it should be more empirical evidence, many more complete fossils 
to make a clear case. The fossil record is void. One, one, here it is. The human fossil record is void, period. We don't have enough fossils. If you're going to make your case, you're going to have to show me the fossils, not one or two. And here, everybody needs to know this, that human fossils, there's few of, okay? We have lots of shell fossils. We have lots of fossils of mammoths. We have lots of fossils. But when it comes to human fossils and the way they're dictating how we evolve, there's very few. There's, there's very few. There's so many problems with this because if you were to bring their evidence to court, they don't have enough to, to, to demonstrate that they're innocent right. or, or, or guilty. There's just not enough information from the fossil record. We know differently that no matter how many fossils you pull out of the ground, we still know where we came from. Right. Ian, Ian Tutsell said that he could fill up a, a uh, truck, uh, um, you know, not a big truck. Uh, a pickup truck. Yeah, I remember that. And you can fill up the back of the pickup truck, uh, and the, fo the fossils will be scattered. But that's how many fossils we have. The fact that we evolved from apes. We don't have the record. You don't have a record. You can't have that because you're you're. Remember, every bone in our body has to change, and so there's got to be transitional forms for that. And the record is bare. The other Completely thing that bare is today in public schools, although though it's part of the curriculum. There are a significant number of teachers that stay away from the ape man controversy. So when we talk about teaching human evolution, I've done a survey and I asked people, you know, young people going to school, have they taught, what do they teach you about? And they say, if you want to believe it, you can believe it. So unless you have a real zealot, most teachers are not going to go, the human, um, the human evolution, man evolution is very controversial in college. They know, they know that the evolution is very problematic. I remember we did a study that in the front of the book, it'll say that evolution is a theory, but then peppered throughout the rest of their manual biology, let's just say, it, they present evolution as a fact. Right. They refer to it as a fact. That's it's damaging. It's, that's, right. that's slanderous. And But the, the idea of the eight-man controversy is, is controversial. Um, if college, of course, is different, uh, if you're taking, especially if you're taking a course on human evolution, you're going to learn about uh, the fossil record and it's going to be taught dogmatically. Okay, so part two. Uh, the difference in skeletal features between the chimp and man demonstrate the overwhelming problems that evolution has to overcome. Now, remember, this is what started me on the essay and started me on this talk, is this book on the pocket, pocket history of human evolution when they told us that every bone in the skeletal feature had to change. So that would be monumental changes. The devil is in the details, and yet evolutionists hold to believe that these changes can happen over time. It's just a belief system. It has to do with deep, deep time. Always deep, deep time, because they have faith in time. Not faith in God. They have yeah. faith in this unbelievable time. Time is, time is their magic dust. Is their magic dust is their God. There is direct correlation of man taking dominion over the earth and his creatures standing tall on two legs as being created in God's image. I believe that we're creating God's image. That's why we stand tall. We're created after Christ, a body like God, body like Christ. We're able to use our two hands in a special way to manage God's creation. So there's a reason why we're standing up, is so that we could use our hands to, to be tool makers of God's creation. And so whether it be working on um, an essay or writing a book, or creating a painting. These hands are very, very important. I've seen people paint with their feet too, by the way. <laughs> okay. Uh, the human brain is much more superior than chimp's brain, or this is part three, or for that, any creature on earth is because God's plan to create us in his image and that we would be given domain over God's creation. Our brain is created that God gave us. It's a God gift is that we can have dominion over God's creation. That's why we have a brain the way we, it's a gift from God and even his creation. It goes on in Psalm 8, 5 says, for you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory, glory and honor. And we see this in Psalm. The brain cell, the neuron connections are so important because we are to be mindful of God. Those connections in our brain tell us one thing. The, correct, the, the Bible says that uh, they're the heart of man. 
the big, I mean, when we talk about the Bible and, and the heart, we're talking about the brain, the brain cells. Uh, the because soul of man is contained within the brain cells. Yes. The brain cell, I mean, the, the brain cells, the connections. And so be mindful of God means that we capture our brain and we capture the cells, the pathways, we point them to God so that our brain, our thoughts, our mind will be focused on him. And, you know, of course, our spirit needs to guide us. We, you know, our flesh pulls us one way and we want to go. Well, we've been blessed with God's spirit because we believe in him and there's children. So anyway, uh, that's important that we be mindful of God and keep those brain, the brain connections towards him. Okay, the next, the last part, what makes humans so unique that there's a huge gap between any creature on earth? It's because the gifts, I mentioned those five gifts. And I like to put it this way. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. The word created is used three times in Genesis 127. God wanted to make sure that we understood that we're very special. Created, created, created. The word image in verse 26 is used once. The word image is used two times. And God made man his own image, image twice. So three times the word image is used from 26, I mean, 26 to 27. And uh, the word create is used three times. You know, and, Tom, re reading this, it, it, we could see that God created us, that we are conscious of him, right. that we have the ability to reach out to him and to know him. This is what makes us so unique. That's right. This conclusion in part four, why are we different than the animals? Because of God made us in his image that we could know him. We wow. Could, we could connect with him. Verse 29, then <clears throat> God blessed them and God said to them, this is a command, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and every over every living creature that moves on the earth, every living creature that moves on the earth, we have the capacity because God made us that way. When I think of all these things about the chip man myth, I know one thing, that that, that myth, is, that's all it is. It's a, it's, it's, it's a lie because we are created in God's image to be dominion, to have dominion, our, our role is to have dominion in God's creation so that we can see him. So Tom, thank you. And I thank the, uh, everybody for listening. And I pray that God will bless you and keep you.